Okay, here's our first case. And we see uh, we're at the level of the ankle joint. We see that the fibula looks like a comma here. That's where usually our uh, talofibular ligaments are. And that doesn't look so good, the anterior talofibular ligament. Um, it should be a nice black structure. But the main reason I'm showing this to you, and you guys look at it and see what you think, is that we have something wrong with our tendons that are behind the fibula. And those, remember, are the perineal tendons. A very common injury back here is a split perineus brevis. Now, you have to remember where the brevis is located. Um, it's usually in front of the longus, or it could be medial to the longus. I think then of longus is lateral, L and L. And these are common injuries of the perineus brevis. You usually see them with dorsiflexion and inversion, and often near the lateral malleolus, but they can extend into the foot. That just brings me into this little diagram that everybody has that points out the different tendons around the ankle that traverse the ankle to act on the foot. There are 10 of them, and we do have a mnemonic for some of them, uh, the, the ones that have more than two, and that includes the Tom, Dick, and Harry mnemonic of the flexor compartment and the Tom, Harry, and Dick mnemonic of the extensor compartment. But remember that you also have a perineus tertius in the extensor compartment, and that goes to the base of the fifth metatarsal. So these are a, a retinacula over the flexor compartment. You have your tibial nerve in there, and this is also called the tarsal tunnel, where you have your flexor tendons. Uh, behind your fibula, you've got the brevis and longus perineus, and do look at the retinaculum over them. It should be nice and thin and not stripped. Uh, it holds them in place because a common problem is subluxation. And there's always a muscle there. That's the perineus brevis muscle. The Tom, Dick, and Harry are the posterior tibial tendon, flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucis longus. And the flexor hallucis usually has a muscle with it. And it's the only tendon that communicates with the ankle joint. So we frequently see fluid in there, even if the patient's not having any problems. Of course, in the back, we have our Achilles tendon as well and we will frequently see tears there. Okay, let's move to something else. We're gonna spend a little time on the knee, and we're gonna see a couple of images. Uh, these are coronal. Now we try to figure out what sequence are we dealing with. Well, there's a dark background, so it's probably not, it probably has fat suppression or it's a stir image. Um, or it could be even gradient echo, but we see bright fluid, and um, we see the background pretty well. So this would probably be a fat suppressed either proton density or T2-weighted sequence. And so far, it looks pretty good back here. Here's the fibula, so we know we're lateral. But all of a sudden, in the meniscus, we know that this is the posterior horn because we see the fibula and we see the PCL. We see some signal. It's kind of splitting up the posterior horn. What could that be? Well, if it's coming from the free edge to the periphery and it involves the top and bottom part of the meniscus, we call that a radial tear. And so this turns out to be a radial tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So on your coronal images, this is what radial tears look like. They will be seen in your posterior and anterior horns on your coronal images. So that's what uh, the plane is for those radial tears. Also notice that you do see the root very well, and you do want to look for the roots that attach your meniscus to the tibia. They come around the bend. And if you don't see a good root, and you have to scroll back and forth, then that means that you've probably got a tear. And if it's just really missing and they've had recent trauma, that's an avulsion. And that's an emergency that you need to call the doctor about because they want to put that back down on the tibia right away. Now we're getting into the body. And the radial tears of the bodies will not be seen well in the coronal plane. What you have to do are your sagittal images to see those. Of course, you will miss some radial tears of the anterior and posterior horn if you just look at the sagittal images. That's a good principle to keep in mind. So what do they look like on the sagittal image? They look like you're interrupting the bow tie meniscus. Normally, depends on the thickness, but you have at least two or three bow ties before you get to two very sharp triangles. And if you're in your first or second or third bow tie, and all of a sudden you see something that looks very blunt, and usually a very bright area next to it, a blunt meniscus, that's a radial tear coming from the free edge to the periphery. These are most common laterally, and this is what they look like if you look at the meniscus. 
And the very small ones will be on your last bow tie, and the larger ones will be on the first bow tie. And this is a bad tear to have because it kind of tears your meniscus and like a zipper, and it makes it extrude, which is an important thing to look for as it goes outside the joint, so that all you have is cartilage on cartilage or bone on bone, and you get osteoarthritis. So it's good to know the appearance of the radial tear and the fact that you need different planes to see it. Even the axial plane can help you in some cases, not all, but here you see the bright fluid getting into the tear. Now I'm not trying to say that your T2 weighted images with fat set are the best for your meniscal tears, they aren't. They turn out to be pretty good for radial tears, but a lot of tears don't even look high signal on T long TE images, so your ideal image sequences are your proton density or your T1 weighted images on your routine spin echoes. You don't want the um, T2 for most of it. You do get good morphologic information from your T2 fat sat. Now let's look at our third case and something that we commonly see and can be confusing. I think we're going to concentrate right now on this ACL and if we don't know much about the ACL we might think that that's a tear. But there are some clues that this is not a tear. We have little masses behind the knee, and we also have a, what looks like a cyst right near the attachment of the ACL to the tibia. So think about what could do that. There's a common problem. It's uh, called mucoid degeneration of the ACL. And it expands your ACL, makes it look kind of bright on T2 weighting. And the thing that a lot of people don't know is that masses spill out of it. They can go anywhere in the joint. They can look like meniscal cysts. They can look like these masses, which I guess in the differential might be neurofibromata, among other things. And they do create these things in the bone that actually migrate away from the surface. So that's what this was. It was all just mucin spilling out of the ACL. You can get it in the PCL and even other ligaments. And uh, we don't know why people get it. I've even seen it in young people. But there are some theories that these, some of these people might have some tears, some partial tears. Other people believe it's degeneration. I think it's both. I think you could have both. So we can't really tell. And if you just see a mass in the ACL, it's probably a ganglion. And we differentiate that from a mucinous degeneration. If there's a mass, it's probably a ganglion. But they are very similar. OK, let's go to our fourth case. We're looking here at the sagittal. We know that that's a T1, and this must be some sort of uh, proton density or T2. And uh, we see that the patellar tendon, it is a tendon because the patella is a sesamoid, and it's an extension of the quadriceps, even though it's between two bones. Uh, we would call it a patellar tendon. And notice that it's thick, first of all. It's as thick as the quadriceps, which it shouldn't be. It should be about eight millimeters or less. And we also see that there's abnormal signal in there. So it looks very focal, and if this were a rotator cuff, we'd call it a partial tear. Versus tendinosis, which would be just some thickening with or without a diffuse signal. Now what do we call that? We call that a jumper's knee. A lot of people have extension injuries and do a lot of, um, of sports with their uh, extensor mechanism will get it. but. Garden variety people who don't do much sports also get jumper's knee. We see it all the time. Okay, let's look at the next one. And I think you've already seen a case like this in a, Dr. Lynch's lecture. But it is tricky, as he mentioned. I think what we pick up here is the ACL tear. And that's what's most important. But if you look carefully at this MR, we actually see that there is some high signal in the marrow at the edge of the tibia. Now, I do have to say that this is not the tibial plateau that gets the Sagan fracture that this is. It's an avulsion of the lateral tibial rim, so be very careful in how you describe that. Uh, it's away from the joint, and um, it almost always means that you've got an ACL tear if you see it on a radiograph like you see here. Uh, sometimes you're going to miss it on your AP film. You might have to oblique the knee, and very frequently people have meniscal tears and ligament tears. That's something to think about. Okay, what about this patient, case six? Something funny in the suprapatellar uh, pouch. Now we have to know our sequences to know what this is, and there's sort of a differential of two. And we've seen in the arthropathy lecture something that looks a little like this. On T1 weighting, we have a lot of bodies, it looks like, that are high signal. So 
We have fat or marrow as our choices. I guess blood, too, could look like this. If you had a fracture, you could have little globules of fat from the marrow. Now, what does it do on our fat-suppressed imaging? It gets dark. I guess still we are stuck because all the things we're thinking about are fat. So we have three choices. And one of them is lipoma arborescence, which I think everybody needs to know, even though it's not that common. It's so classic. And how would we tell that from bodies or from globules of fat from a fracture? We'd look at the radiograph. Bodies should show up on the radiograph as bodies of bone, whereas lipoma arborescence will show up nothing or little globules of fat. And uh, the fracture would be obvious, hopefully, on the radiograph and the MR if you had globules of fat from that. So this one is when your synovium goes wild again, like PBNS and synovial chondromatosis, but it makes fat. And we do see this commonly in people that have rheumatoid or OA. Uh, I've seen it in children, though, but I think of it more in older people. And the treatment is synovectomy. And they always have a big effusion, and it can be in any bursa of the body. So you can see it in the shoulder bursa, the iliopsoas bursa, and uh, so check that radiograph. Okay, what about this patient? Uh, it's a little different scenario than we usually see this, but it brings up a big point. This was somebody who had a meniscectomy um, a few days before this MR and had a pretty normal looking MR before surgery. So she went walking in Tiburon on our Blackie's pasture path, and uh, she all of a sudden felt this really severe knee pain, and she probably shouldn't have been walking so quickly, you know, right after surgery. So what do we see? Well, we do see that the meniscus is extruded, and that's something you always have to look for. Use the tibia as your measure. If it's off of the tibia, especially uh, on the medial side, more than like two or three millimeters, you call that extrusion. In this case, it might just be from the meniscectomy. Uh, we see that her bone marrow looks abnormal in the medial femoral condyle. It's on the weight-bearing surface. There's some bone marrow reactive change. I, I prefer that word to edema because edema is so nonspecific and it suggests that it's all fluid, which it isn't. And we see a line in here on this weight-bearing surface. So what is this? We used to call it sonk or spontaneous osteonecrosis, but in the old days, they thought it was osteonecrosis that was the problem. It turns out it's not osteonecrosis for most of these patients. It's like an uh, insufficiency fracture or a stress fracture. Uh, and the bone, when there's no meniscus cushion, starts to get these fractures. So now we could call it still sunk, and it's okay to call it that. But if we know that it's insufficiency fracture, some people are calling it sink, spontaneous insufficiency fracture of the knee. But they are on the weight-bearing surface. That's a key thing. They cause acute onset of pain. And sometimes these are older females in particular. So it makes us think that some of them have low bone density. But remember, it's not everybody who has that. And the key thing here is that it actually it's been described in the post-op patient, too, uh, when they've had meniscectomy, which was an interesting finding that I've seen in several patients now. The differential, osteochondritis dissecans or infarct. Now, how could you tell the difference? I think you can, for the most part, especially OCD. Because of the location, osteochondritis dissecans is also very frequently on the medial femoral condyle, but near the notch. And in younger patients, then we see this sink or sonk. And uh, here's an example. And it might be hard to see on the radiograph. I can't even tell. Yeah, it's on the medial side right there. But if you do an MR here, you see beautifully how there's a fragment, and it looks like it's loose because it has a high signal interface with the parent bone. So that is osteochondritis dissecans. It affects especially the knee, the ankle, and the elbow. And remember that it's called dissecans, not desiccans. OK, that could irritate anybody just to say desiccans. All right, what about infarcts? Uh, they can look just like sink or sonk. Um, especially if they're only in one place, then I think you have a hard time figuring it out. But often they're multiple, and then, like this case, there's no question that this is infarcts, and then we have our whole differential of why a person would have infarcts, and I won't go through that right now. I'm sure you have your laundry list of differentials for that. They're usually serpentine and bright on T2, uh, low signal on T1, often with fat in the middle, 
And the last thing I'll say about these is that they can look like a contusion early on. They may not have this serpentine appearance, but that's uh, very early on. Okay, let's look at this case. I think probably you all will get this one. Um, we have, but it's on MR, so we have a differential. A bone marrow edema-like pattern in the femoral head and neck, low on T1, high signal on T2, probably an effusion, normal joint space. What do we think about? Well, this is our list of things to think about, and we would want to see a radiograph. That's very important. Transient osteoporosis is now thought to be a stress reaction as well. And uh, we will see that on our MRs and on our radiographs. Often we'll see osteopenia with normal joint space. And it's uh, sort of classic, we'll go through that in a second. Now if you only see it on MR, they've called it the transient bone marrow edema syndrome. It may, both of these go away after a few months. What else could look like that? Well, avascular necrosis actually could look like that too. Usually you see a line in there, but uh, you know that's definitely in the differential. Stress fracture, you can get them in your femoral head. They look just like AVN. Uh, that would be in the differential. If somebody had just had trauma to their hip, they might get a contusion that looks like this too. And if you're under the age of 30 and you have edema pattern in your hip, in the femoral neck especially, Think about osteoid osteoma and remember how to work that one up. Do a CT, thin section CT, or a bone scan to see the little nidus. Uh, infection could look just like this. Uh, so that's in the diff. And infiltrative neoplasm, things like uh, leukemia might have that bone marrow edema pattern that's in the femoral head and neck. But here's the radiograph of that patient. And I think now we feel a little like we can uh, make this easier to figure out because there's osteopenia, there's a normal joint space, and number one would be transient osteoporosis. Although osteoid osteoma, if it's a young patient, could look just like this. It usually gives you osteopenia. If it's in the joint, uh, it doesn't cause sclerosis. Infection early on, but it doesn't have any narrowing, so much less likely would be infection. So remember that the transient osteoporosis, and this is sort of a trick thing, but it turns out it's more common in males than females. But when you have it in females, it's in the third trimester of pregnancy, and uh, it's self-limited, and hot on bone scan, and uh, you do have edema on MR and effusion, that edema word. Okay, let's look at case nine. This uh, is a hip, believe it or not, and what uh, plane are we in? Well, this is a sagittal view of the hip on an MR arthrogram. So we have to know our anatomy there, but the main thing we have to know is that the uh, little labra come off of the anterior and posterior acetabulum. We've got cartilage on the acetabulum and the femoral head, although there's a break that's normal in the cartilage here uh, in the middle. Now what do we see? We're doing an arthrogram. It's T1 fat sat to bring out the dilute GAD. We see high signal in the labrum. And if you see it in the front on the sagittal image, it's in the anterior labrum. And this is a very classic location for a labral tear. These patients with labral tears tend to present with clicking of their hip, and they often have pain and locking. And I guess the real buzz thing right now is femoroacetabular impingement because the orthopods can treat it. And I think it's good to really know about that, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, but other things that can give you labral tears are any childhood hip disease, because you put abnormal stress on your labrum, in particular developmental dysplasia of the hip or leg perthes, trauma, and osteoarthritis will give you labral tears, but by that point it's not so important to have a labral tear because you have to worry about the whole joint, and usually those patients end up with um, replacements. And of course you could just have it for no good reason at all. Uh, here we can see, again, the anterior and posterior labrum on the axial image, and you can see the higher signal there in the anterior labrum, which you're also seeing on the sagittal image, a tear. What about FAI, or femoroacetabular impingement? Well, what it is is when you're dealing with the femur and the femoral head neck junction and the acetabulum, when they hit abnormally against each other, then you get labral tears and cartilage damage and a few other things like herniation pits. And, um, we have to know what to look for. If it's on the femoral side, we usually think about that being at the femoral head neck junction, anteriorly or laterally. There's some asphericity 
And this is called cam impingement because it's like the cam of a car, it's asymmetric. And you can imagine how if that hits a normal acetabulum, you get a labral tear because it hits prematurely and really pulls, pushes on the labrum and the cartilage. On the other hand, uh, and we see this in young males in particular, uh, we have this type of a FAI where you have overgrowth of the anterior acetabulum. And you can get that if you have a deep hip like a protrusio acetabuli or if, or if you have what we call retroversion of the acetabulum. And so you have a normal femur, but this hits your femur prematurely, especially with adduction and internal rotation of your hip, although it can be in other maneuvers as well. Turns out, even though we try to differentiate all these things, that most people have a mixture of the cam and pincer impingement. What do we look for? Well, look for things like these, what we call bumps at the femoral head neck junction. Although we have to be very careful because some people have them and are not symptomatic at all. And so we can't say impingement that they definitely have it if we see that. Some people are just born with what we call this pistol grip deformity or an exaggerated little bump there. And uh, they're just unfortunate. And I think a lot of it is genetic, although some people think slips of the femoral capital epiphysis can pre preclude to that too. Okay, what about case 10? Here we have a pain, patient with pain on the lateral aspect of the hip, and I just want you to be aware of tendons that are attaching to the greater trochanter, the medius and minimus tendons. They can get tears in tendinosis, and we see a tear here of the gluteus medius tendon. It's very painful and, again, more common in older females. So just check that area on your hip radiographs and MRs, or on your MRs for that kind of a high signal. You can also get a bursa out there. What about in the wrist? Uh, things to think about are the ligament tears of the proximal carpal row, and in this case, we see they had radial sided uh, pain. There's a scapho lunate ligament tear. This is an arthrogram with T1 fat sat, and we see the GAD getting in. And you can also see it on your axial images. Uh, so here are the scapho lunate and lunar triquetral ligaments. Here's the triangular fiber cartilage that goes across between the ulna and the carpal bones. And you really need to know about this ulnocarpal impaction syndrome if you're ever looking at MRs of the wrist. And uh, well, you usually get an ulna that's uh, got positive ulnar variance, meaning that it's one millimeter longer than the radius or more at the level of the very medial aspect of the radius. Now, what does that do? It hits, the ulnar head hits on the uh, lunate and the triquetrum, and you can get triangular fiber cartilage tears lunar triquetral ligament tears, and sometimes the marrow will be abnormal in that little corner. And the treatment is to do osteotomy of the ulna, make it shorter, take off the ulnar head, or make the radius longer. In the elbow, I guess the main things to think about are some of the tendons, triceps, biceps, but also the ones that come off of the epicondyles. It's good to know that on the lateral side you have uh, extensors, and on the medial side you've got flexors. And if we look at this poor tendon right here, we see that it's thick and has diffuse abnormal signal, but no focal signal, so that would be tendinosis of the extensor tendon or lateral epicondylitis. I think everybody knows about this one, the rotator cuff tear. I showed it to you in the arthritis lecture. A high riding uh, humerus usually means rotator cuff tear. If you want to look at the muscles, do look at your sagittal images, draw a line through the top where you get to the Y, let me do that. And usually the supraspinatus muscle goes above the Y with that line, the tangent sign. If it's ever below, it's definitely atrophic. And look for fatty infiltration as well. Those are very important. What is this case showing? Well, there's no biceps in the groove, first of all. It looks like it's dislocated. Now, usually when you dislocate the biceps, not always, but usually there's a subscapularis tendon tear. It could be partial or full thickness, and what we see here is a retracted full thickness subscapularis tendon tear. So think about that. It could also sublux into a partial tear of the subscapularis tendon. Finally, let's just go through a few tears of the labrum associated with anterior dislocation. Here we can see that in the anterior inferior labrum there, there is this uh, little labrum that's separated from the glenoid, and we call that the bankard lesion. We also notice this uh, flattening and high signal in the, femoral, the uh, humeral head 
consistent with a Hill Sachs lesion, which is in the top two centimeters of the uh, humerus, laterally and posteriorly. And one thing you want to do is quantify this big defect. This is called engaged anterior dislocation, when the humerus kind of engages on the anterior inferior glenoid. And it takes a lot to reduce that, and uh, it's especially common if you have a large Hill Sachs lesion. The Bankar lesion is when your labrum is separated from the glenoid by a uh, periosteal um, attachment being torn. So it's free to float in the joint. And that's what this one is. Now there are some variants. This one is still attached to the periosteum and it's balled up medially as you can see on the scope. And so how does this differ? Because it's in a different location, it's still attached to the periosteal attachment. We call that the ALPSA lesion. And here's a picture of an ALPSA, and you can look at this carefully to see the difference between that and the bank heart. The third variation on the theme of the bank heart is when your labrum anteroinferiorly is still attached to the scapular periosteum, but it's not balled up. And you can sometimes have a hard time seeing the tear. Abduction, external rotation will bring it out. You can see here the tear. And this one is called the Perthes lesion. And you can see that on this diagram right here. Here's a Perthes on abduction, external rotation, and scope. And just to end, I just wanted to show the little cysts that we'll see around the glenoid and the scapula. And they usually mean that you've got a labral tear of the glenoid. But also, they suggest sometimes that you might have denervation. And you'll see abnormal signal within the muscle in the setting of denervation. If you have a tear that's involving the suprascapular notch, that's usually a slap lesion. You might get a cyst there affecting your suprascapular nerve, and you might knock out the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle innervation. If you just get a tear in the back of the shoulder, it may just go into the area called the spinal glenoid notch, and that might just knock out the infraspinatus. So there are different ways to uh, present this one's high up, so it's affecting both super and infraspinatus. And that will present early with the edema-like pattern and later with atrophy and fatty infiltration. If you have a cyst below that level in the uh, spinal glenoid notch, you might just get the infraspinatus.